Chapter Twenty Five of Alcatraz by Max Brand. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Little Smoky. Pure madness poured into the brain of Red Paris as he saw the fall. Here then was the end of the trail, and that great battle would never be fought. Groaning, he rode to the bank of the stream, mechanically gathering up the rope as he went. He saw below him nothing but the rush of water, white riffles showing its speed. An occasional dark streak whirled past, the trunks of trees which the little Smoky had chewed away from their foothold on its sides. Doubtless, one of these burly missiles had struck and instantly killed the stallion. But no, yonder, his head broke above the surface, a great log flung past him, missing the goal by inches. A whirl in the current rolled him under, but up he came again, swimming gallantly. The selfish rage which had consumed Red Paris broke out in words. Down the bank he trotted the buckskin, shaking his fist at Alcatraz and pouring the stream of his curses at that devoted head. Was this the reward of labor, the reward of pain and patience through all the weeks, the sleepless nights, the weary days? "'Drown and be damned!' shouted Red Paris, as if in answer. The body of the stallion rose miraculously from the stream, and the hunter gasped his incredulity. Alcatraz was facing upstream, half his body above the surface. The explanation was simple. At this point the little Smoky abated its speed a little and had dropped a load of rolling stones and sand. An hour later it might be washed away, but now it made a strong bank with the current skimming above the surface. On this the stallion had struck, and, whirling with the current, he faced towards the source of the valley and looked into the volleying waters. Here surely was a sight to make a weakling tremble. But to the astonishment of Paris, he saw the head of the stallion raised, and the next moment the thunder of his neigh rang high above the voices of the river, as though he bade defiance to his destroyer, as though he called on the gods of gods to bear witness that he died without fear. By the eternal breathed red Paris, smitten with awe, and the next instant, the ground giving way beneath him, Alcatraz was bowled over and over, only to come up again farther down the stream. He turned his head. Far away he made out a line of horsemen, gray, ghostly figures miles away. Hervey was keeping to his word then, but the thought of his own danger did not hold Red Jim Paris for a moment. Down there in the thundering waters, Alcatraz was dying. The heart of Red Paris went out to the dauntless chestnut. He spurred down the bank until he was even with the struggler. He swayed far out, riding the mustang so near the brink that the poor creature shuddered. He capped his hands about his lips, and the hunter screamed encouragement to the hunted, yelled advice, shrieked his warnings, when tree trunks hurtled from behind. It seemed to Red Paris that Alcatraz was not a brute beast, but a soul about to perish. So much do brave men love courage. Then he saw, a hundred yards away, that the bank of the stream fell away until it became a gradually shoaling beach to the water edge. With a shout of hope, he raced to this point of vantage and flung himself from the saddle. Then, grasping the rope, he ran into the stream until it foamed with staggering force about his hips. But would Alcatraz live among those sweeping tree trunks and come within casting distance of the rope? Even if he did, would the rope catch around that head of which only the nose and eyes were showing? Even if it caught, could the stallion be drawn to shoal water without being strangled by the slipknot? Had Paris been a calm man, he would have discarded the thousandth chance which remained after all these possibilities. He would have looked instead to his cowpony, which was now cantering away towards liberty in the rear of the flying squadron of mares. But Paris saw and lived for only one thing. Down came that brave head, but now with the ears flattened, for in the fury of the river his strength was being rapidly exhausted. 
down the current it came, momentarily nearer, but always with dangers shooting about it. Even while Paris looked, a great tree, from which the branches had not yet been stripped, rushed from behind. The hunter's yell of alarm was drowned by the thousand voices of the little Smoky, and over that head the danger swept. Red Paris closed his eyes and his head fell, but when he looked again the tree was far downstream and the stallion still swam in the central current, but now near, very near. Only the slender outer branches could have struck him, and these with barely sufficient force to drive him under. Paris strode still further into the wild water until it foamed about his waist, and stretching out his arms he called to the stallion. Had he possessed ten times the power of voice, he could not have made himself heard above the rioting of the little Smoky, but his gesture could be seen, and even a dumb beast could understand it. The chestnut at least comprehended, for to the joy of Paris he now saw those gallant ears come forward again, and turning as well as he could, Alcatraz swam stoutly for the shore. In the hour of need, the great enemy had become his last hope. But his progress toward the sloping bank was small. For every inch he fought to the bank, the current carried him a foot downstream. Yet those inches gained in the lateral direction were every one priceless. Finally, Paris swung the lariat and shot it through the air. Fair and true, the circle struck above the head of the stallion, and the hunter shouted with hysterical triumph. A moment later he groaned, as the current whirled the rope over the head of Alcatraz and downstream. Yet he fought the hopeless fight. Staggering in the currents, beaten from his footing time and again, Paris stumbled downstream, gathering his rope for a new cast as he went. Neither had the chestnut abandoned the struggle. His last efforts had swerved him about, and now he headed upstream with the water foaming about his red, distended nostrils. But still, through the whipping spray, his great eyes were fixed on Paris. As for the man, there was a prayer in the voice with which he shouted, Alcatraz, and hurled the rope again. Heavy with the water it had soaked up, the noose splashed in a rough circle around the head of the swimmer, and then cut down into the water. Hand over hand he drew in the slack, felt resistance, then a jar that toppled him from his foothold. The noose had indeed caught around the neck of the stallion, but the success threatened to be his ruin. Toppled head over heels in the rush of the little smoky, still his left hand gripped the rope, and as he came gasping to the surface, his feet struck and lodged strongly against the surface of a great boulder. His one stroke of luck. He had no time to give thanks. The next moment, the full weight of the torrent on Alcatraz whipped the lariat quivering out of the water. The horse was struggling in the very center of the strongest current, and the tug on the arm of Paris made his shoulder sockets ache. He endured that pain, praying that his hands would not slip on the wet rope. Then, little by little, he increased his pull until all the strength of his leg muscles, back and arms, was brought to bear. It seemed that there was no result. Alcatraz did not change his position, but inch by inch the rope crept into him. He at length could shift holds, whipping his right hand in advance of the left and tugging again. There was more rapid progress now, but as the first frenzy of nervous energy was dissipated, a tremor of exhaustion passed through his limbs, and the beat of his heart redoubled until he was well-nigh stifled. True, the rope was coming in hand over hand now, but another danger. The head of Alcatraz was sinking. His nostrils distended to the bursting point, his eyes red and bulging from their sockets. He was being throttled by the grip of the slipknot, and an instant later his head disappeared beneath the surface. Then all weakness passed from Red Paris. There was invigorating wine in the air he breathed. A vast power clothed him suddenly, and while the frenzy endured, he drew Alcatraz swiftly in from the gripping currents 
and to the comparatively mild swirl of water where he stood. Wavering, distorted, and dim as an image in a dull mirror, he saw the form of the horse float towards him beneath the water. Still the frenzy was on him. It enabled him to spring from his place, tear the strangling noose from the neck of the stallion, and lifting that lifeless head in both hands, struggled towards the shore. The water buoyed a weight which he could not otherwise have budged. He stumbled in the shoaling gravel to his knees, rose again lifting and straining until blackness rushed across his eyes and he pitched forward on his face. He wakened in a whipping rain that stung the back of his neck and as he propped himself up on his arms he found that he had been lying across the neck and shoulders of the stallion. That much of him and the slender forelegs was clear of the water. But had he not brought a dead thing to land? He bent his cheek to the nostrils of Alcatraz, but he felt no breath. He came reeling to his knees and slid his hand beneath the water to the heart of the horse. He felt no reassuring throb. Yet he could not be sure that the end was indeed come, for the blood raged and surged through his brain and waves of violent trembling passed over him so that his sense of touch might well belie the truth. How long had he lain unconscious? A minute or an hour? At least he must try to get the body further ashore. Alas, his strength hardly sufficed now to raise the head alone, and when he made his effort his legs crumpled beneath him. There he sat with the head of Alcatraz in his lap, he the hunter, and this the hunted. There was small measure of religion in Red Paris, but now in helplessness he raised his trembling hands to the stormy gray of the sky above him. God Almighty, said Red Paris, I sure ain't done much to make you listen to me, but I've got this to say, that if they's a call for something to die right now, it ain't the horse that's to blame. It's me that's hounded him into the river. Alcatraz ain't any pet, but he sure lived according to his rights. Let him live, and I'll let him go free. I got no right to him. I didn't make him. I never owned him. But let him stand up on his four legs again. Let me see him go galloping once more, the finest horse that ever bucked the fool man out of the saddle, and I'll call it quits." It was near to a prayer, if indeed this were not a prayer in truth. And glancing down to the head on his lap, he shivered with superstitious wonder. Alcatraz had unquestionably drawn a long and sighing breath. End of chapter 25